Sometimes I feel the weight of the world fall down on me so heavy. And I need a friendly voice with some good theology. Calvinistically speaking, though I mix a manly drink, Pepsi and shoe polish. And I hit the YouTube link. Don't say hit, that sounds violent. And I feel my troubles all melt away. Oh, oh. Your Calvinist podcast is filmed before a live studio audience. And welcome back to Your Calvinist podcast. My name is Keith Foskey, and I am Your Calvinist. I want to thank you for being with me today. And today's show is going to be a little bit different because, well, one, I don't have a guest. It's just going to be me. But also, I'm getting ready to go out of town, and we had kind of a difficult week last week at our family, and there's just a lot going on that I wanted to share with you. I want to thank the many of you who reached out with me, uh, reached out to me with cards and letters, and especially those who reached out to my wife. Many people in our church brought meals and different things because last week my wife did lose her mother. So uh, it was a difficult week, and um, we're still dealing with all of the things that go along with grief, and we appreciate your prayers and uh, ask you to continue to pray for us as we go through this difficult time. Uh, This week coming up, we're going to be leaving as a family, going to Knoxville, Tennessee, where I'm going to be preaching at the Laborers Conference. I've been looking forward to that. I am. The podcast is a part of the Truth and Love Network, and the brothers that are in that podcasting network are going to be gathering for a conference on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm going to be the last one to preach on Sunday morning. And I'm going to be preaching on the subject of the Spirit's work in the church. And so I would encourage you, if you're in the Knoxville area, to come visit with us. It's going to be a free conference, and there's still room. If you want to sign up, just Google uh, the um, Truth and Love Network. You can find out all about it on that website. Uh, Also, I ask you to continue to pray for me. As many of you know, I've been dealing with some issues in my feet, uh, some some problems health-wise. And you'll notice in the background to my... uh, side here, I have a crutch. I'm actually having to walk with a crutch this week as the doctors have determined that I have a form of arthritis in my foot. And so they're uh, in my feet. And so we're trying to figure out some of the things that might help me uh, because it's making it difficult to get around and do some of the things that I need to do. So thank you for your prayers for that as well. And I uh, also have a few other things I want to mention before we get to the topic of the show today. Uh, remember, as always, this show is a ministry of Sovereign Grace Family Church. So if you're in the Jacksonville, Florida area, come visit us at Sovereign Grace Family Church. You can learn more about us at F- sgfcjax.org. And you can find us on YouTube, SGFC Jacks. All of our sermons from me and our other pastors are there, uh, Sunday school lessons. And uh, you can also find us on Sermon Audio. I want to also mention, as I have been mentioning, 1689 Cigars. They're a great group of guys. And um, people ask me, why are you supporting a cigar company? And by the way, here is a, a reminder. This is 1689 Cigars. This is my one of our deacons there, uh, Brother Mike, and uh, his brother-in-law, Kenny, a good friend of mine. And they are avid cigar smokers. And they have smoked some of the 1689 cigars, said so they enjoyed them very much. So if you go there and you use the coupon code Superior Theology, you will get a percentage off. And again, I was going to say earlier, people ask, why are you supporting uh, uh, cigars? Aren't they bad? Well, I don't think cigars are bad in the same way that I think an occasional um, drink of alcohol is not bad. Something that we can do to the glory of God. As Spurgeon said, he smoked a cigar to the glory of God. Um, as long as we treat it like that and treat it as something that we get to do uh, and enjoy as part of God's good creation and not something that we overdo, so not something that we, you know, people don't normally chain smoke cigars. So uh, that's just something to consider uh, as to, um, you know, why I would do that. But also, uh, 1689 Cigars is supporting 
bivocational ministers. This is a, 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 a there's a, a pastor that I've spoken to about this, and uh, this is part of what he's doing to help support his ministry. And uh, he's getting the cigars uh, through a church where the church actually meets in Columbia, and they are um, meeting in a, t- a tobacco barn. And so this is how the church helps support itself. So this is why as a podcast, uh, I'm supporting them, not, fi- not f- they're not giving me money. I don't want their money. I want to be able to support them because I believe uh, that it is supporting a ministry and a godly ministry. So if, for anyone who had that question, that's what it's for. And uh, one day I'm going to try to have Chance, the, the, the brother from 1689 Cigars, as a guest on the show. Just haven't been able to get that done yet. Also want to mention uh, my website, KeithFosky.com. If you haven't been there, please go and check it out. Uh, We now have a link to our t-shirt store. And if you haven't seen some of our really cool t-shirts, I put up a new one this week. You guys know my my line that I use in church soup, which is, uh, I hope it was a blast for them because it was certainly a blast for me. Well, we've got two new shirts with that design. And if you're interested, you can go now to KeithFosky.com and you'll find a link to our store to be able to buy those t-shirts. And as always, if you're enjoying the show, please hit a thumbs up. And if you're not enjoying the show, please hit the thumbs down button twice. All right, well, let's move on to our topic for today. And what I'm gonna talk about today is something that has come in via email from a couple of different people. And uh, I'm thankful when you guys send me emails because it gives me ideas to go and talk about on the show. Uh, Sometimes you recommend people that I should interview. And sometimes you just say, hey, here's a topic I wanna hear about. And several times on the show, I have mentioned how our church used to be part of the Disciples of Christ. And now we are what we would identify as a Reformed Baptist church, even though R. Scott Clark told me last week that that's not a proper category. Either way, that's that's basically how we would identify, or a particular Baptist church. And so what we're going to talk about today is how that process happened. Now, I'm going to link in the description of this video a series I did back in 2020, where I did a series of short uh, audio podcasts on the subject of how our church became reformed. And I walk through the process and I walk through all the different things that happened leading up to and following. It's five 15 to 20 minute episodes because I used to do a, a daily uh, coffee with a Calvinist. And so it was part of that. I'll link that below. But today I want to specifically uh, share with you that during this during that time, back in between 2008 and 2009, I wrote my resignation letter, and it ended up becoming a letter where I took a stand for my understanding of the Scripture. And so I want to give the history of our church short version. If you want to hear the longer version, you can go listen to the, the ones in the description below. And then I'm going to read to you what I wrote to the congregation. And I want to give you then what the aftermath was. So this is going to be sort of a biography of our church. And again, this has been several people have emailed me asking about this. Uh, several people have said, hey, you know, you've, you've mentioned this, you know, kind of in passing, but, but we want to hear the whole story. And, um, you know, like this brother here, uh, Dennis sent me an email. He says that he is in uh, he, he is in. A, a, a dying DOC church, and um, he wanted to kind of hear the story uh, of, of, you know, the things that are going on uh, that, that had happened at our church and, um, you know, wanted, wanted to hear more about the history of the transition from the Disciples of Christ to being uh, a, a Baptist church. So, Dennis, thank you for sending in this email. There are a few others that have sent in emails, um, but this was the last one that I got, and I said, you know what, if there's an interest in it, I want to share the story. So, um, so that's what we're doing today. So it began, our church began in 1958. Uh, It began as a church plant. Um, That's basically what it was, or a, um, a, a there was a church in downtown Jacksonville, 
and they decided to to plant a church on the north side and it was part of the disciples of christ if i remember correctly it was riverside christian church that planted forest christian church now i i could be wrong on that unfortunately the person who would know for sure uh, was my old friend and sunday school teacher miss patsy hoffman who's no longer with us she would know for sure uh, but she's <laughs> she's not available to be asked but i think it was um uh, and when I say she's no longer with us, she went to be with the Lord many years ago. She was a very good friend of mine up until the day she passed away. And uh, and I loved her very much and still continue to be grateful for the things that she did in my life. But she was with the church. She was one of the few charter members. She was there in 58 when the church began. She and uh, Jack Bunning and Shirley Bunning and a few people, Jack and Shirley are still in our church today, uh, were part of the the early part of the church. And so the way that it started <clears throat> was a plant of the of a of another Disciples of Christ Church, and it 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 went through various pastors. Um, I've looked at the history of our church and I've seen sort of the the pro- progress and 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 some some pastors had some really interesting history. Uh, as as my stepmom came into this church, I think in the seventies. Um, and she would tell me about there was a pastor who had a wife who was Jewish, so she would not attend worship, which I thought was very odd. Um, and uh, in the 80s, when I came into the church, my dad and mom got a divorce when I was uh, six or seven. I think around I think we were six. I was six and about to turn seven when they got a divorce because I, I know I, I went to Forest when I was seven. And that's because that's when I met my stepmom. And one of the first things she did was start bringing me to church. And it's the same church I'm, this, the church I pastor now is the church I grew up in. Uh, and which is an amazing uh, uh, story in, in and of itself. But I don't want to make that the story for today. So as I came into the church, there was one of the first pastors I remember. Uh, he was a, a, a very very fit man did a lot of exercising and stuff i remember that he was he was funny he did a he did a, a one time we had a talent show and he did like a like a magic show he was a, a very funny guy very you know very athletic um enjoyed being with the kids would come and play with us would invite us to his home we would go uh, his he had a son about my age we'd go over to his house go swimming so nice guy but theologically he was a train wreck uh, and I didn't know that because being seven, eight, nine years old, I don't, I don't know, you know, what's going on. Um, and <clears throat> come to find out, he did not believe in the virgin birth, which means that he had been likely influenced by critical theory and uh, specifically textual criticism, which argues for the absence of the virgin birth in the Isaiah passage uh, and the Isaiah prophecy. And that essentially the virgin birth of Christ was a, uh, a later myth that was imposed upon the Jesus story, which that obviously is not something that any conservative Christian would believe, certainly not what I believe, but it was what was taught in the church. And it was something that the church didn't really know about. I've talked to Patsy Hoffman about this. She said when they hired him, they didn't know that he was that far afield. Um, and when they did find out about it, they immediately began to try to, you know, look for his departure. And he wasn't there very long. But that just goes to show you the sort of the history of the, the DOC. The Disciples of Christ, they're part of the, um, the Campbellite movement, which began in the 1800s. And the Campbellite movement had spawned several churches. You have the, the Churches of Christ, which are more conservative uh, of the Campbellites, typically non-instrumental Church of Christ, very conservative. Um, then you have the Independent Christian Church, which is more moderate, and then you have the Disciples of Christ, which are more liberal. Now, again, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but it, it, that's that's basically the general idea. And so, within the Disciples, you had churches that were super liberal, and like I remember a few years ago, uh, before we left the Disciples. Or before we changed our name, rather, we were we were still Forest Christian Church up until 2011. Uh, I, I I would get invitations to Disciples of Christ events in Jacksonville. One of the events that we were invited to was to go listen to John Dominic Crossum teach. And if you know anything about John Dominic Crossum, then you understand what kind of liberalism was being promoted and 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 encouraged. So anyhow, the church was was theologically kind of all over the map. 
they had different pastors who believed different things. And throughout the years, you know, I remember certain pastors that I really got along with well that were very sweet. Uh, Reverend Joe Jones was very sweet to me. Um, Reverend Bob McIndoo, very uh, godly man, sweet man. And he was an interim pastor for a while. Uh, in fact, um, I remember as a little boy wanting to pray, uh, lead the congregation in prayer. And I think it was Reverend Bob McIndoo who allowed me to do that. So just a lot of um, a lot of things that I remember from my youth. I remember, again, theology was not the priority. And yet it would I would say, as a Disciples of Christ Church, still a socially conservative. That's what I've, I've always said about our church, was socially conservative, but theologically liberal. And liberal maybe is the wrong word. Theologically um, confused. That would be the better word. Socially conservative, theologically confused. And we see some of that theological confusion in things like they were they they allowed for female elders, uh, which was allowed in the Disciples of Christ, very, very common in the Disciples of Christ. And so that was part of the theological confusion, because obviously I would argue now that that female elders are wrong. And um, so that's the that, that's sort of the history. And in 93, we took on a pastor. His name was uh, Daryl Olges, and Daryl Olges was the pastor of my teenage years. And uh, Daryl was, um, his, his, his preaching style was very unique. He was, uh, he, he was very, not theological hardly at all. He was a, he was a storyteller, and he would, he would read a passage from the scriptures, and he would tell stories that went along with it. He would get stories from everywhere from the Reader's Digest to uh, old magazines to uh, periodicals. He, he was just a very, it was very interesting, his, his preaching style. And, um, but what Daryl did do was Daryl had a tremendous business acumen. He actually was, not only was the pastor of our church, but he was the dean of Jones Business College in Jacksonville. So very intelligent man. And Daryl was, um, he was instrumental in doing a lot of positive things for our church. He moved our church to a new building, had a new building built, took, took us to the entire building program, which was incredible, uh, which was nice, for, especially for a small church that didn't have a lot of money. He was very good at managing everything. And then in 1999, he was actually the one who spearheaded us leaving the Disciples of Christ. So I give him a tremendous amount of credit. As, as, as I watched through the history of our church of sort of this this. Uh, if you will, spectrum of change that happened and sort of how it went from one thing to the other to the other, you know, going all the way back to the, to the man who didn't believe in the virgin birth to where we are now. It's a, it's a huge leap, but it, it wasn't all taken by one person and it wasn't always taking, it wasn't every step by, by one step at a time, or, or it wasn't one gigantic step. It was one little step at a time. And, and Daryl causing us to leave the disciples was huge. It was very helpful. Because in leaving the disciples, what happened was, and, and let me go back, why we left the disciples. The last national conference that we went to with the Disciples of Christ Church, there was a, there, there was so much oddness that was going on. One of the, I mean, Daryl came back and, and, and reported to us that there was, that there was like a table where they were handing out condoms and, and, and encouraging, uh, you know, safe sex. And, 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 and uh, they were promoting things like abortion and stuff like that. It was, it was really crazy. But they were also, uh, Daryl brought back the minutes from the meetings and they were promoting what we would now probably call wokeness because that's the modern term for sort of leftist ideas. Um, but the, it was the same type of thing you know, promoting the what what we would call today LGBT. Back then, it was different. It was uh, you know the they would say same sex marriage stuff like that. Promoting homosexual pastors, and it's in the minutes. I have the minutes. Uh, I'm not sure where they are right now, but I know that I have them because I remember sharing them with Dr. James White when we were together. I wanted him to see that what's going on in churches today was was going on 25 years ago in the Disciples of Christ, 26 years ago, and. So when Daryl came back from that meeting, he said, you know what, we can't do this anymore. This is not going to work. Um, we, so he encouraged the church to leave the Disciples of Christ. And we, I mean, I was, I, I, at that point I had just gotten saved. I got married in 99. I got saved that same 
maybe a couple months later. I mean, it, it was a lot of things were happening in our life. And the idea of leaving the denomination, I didn't have any real hard, I didn't have any hard, strong ties to it, even though I grew up in it, because now that I was saved, I just wanted the Bible. I just wanted what God, what God's Word said. And so if, if leaving the disciples meant we were going the biblical way, that's what I wanted to do. And so we did, and the church left the disciples of Christ. And then it was shortly thereafter that uh, I began to, because I'd just gotten saved, I began to show real interest in, in doing ministerial work. And I began to do work with Daryl, and I began to go and meet with him, and he would give me little odd jobs to do, and, and I would, uh, you know, do Bible studies and, 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 and do different things around the church. I mean, I just wanted to be a part of what was going on. This is the church I grew up in. I didn't have any desire to go anywhere else, even though the church wasn't, at that point, he was still preaching the same way he'd always preached. He's still doing the same thing he'd always done, but my wife and I felt very very much like we were supposed to be there. Even though we visited a few churches, we never felt quite the same as we did when we were there. It just always felt like this was where God wanted us. And so, um, and I've told this, again, I want to make it all about me, but the the Sunday after 9-11, I preached my first sermon. So this was two years after I got saved. And after that, God confirmed my call to ministry, and I went to seminary, and the church did afford for me to go to seminary, which was nice. Uh, toward the end of my seminary time, I began to be, or actually towards the maybe two, two-thirds of the way through, I began to be more convinced of Reformed theology, Calvinism specifically, the five points of Calvinism, was introduced to the Founders Ministries. A lot of things were going on in my life. And in 2005, I began preaching full-time, even though Daryl didn't retire until 2006. He allowed me to take over preaching duties on Sunday night in 2004, so I preached an entire year on Sunday night where it was me getting to preach. It's what I wanted. I, I went to, I want to preach. Give me any opportunity to preach, I'll take it, because I feel like this is what God wants me to do. So uh, he gave me the opportunity to preach, and I preached, uh, I think, through Genesis the first uh, first year. Um, I did it again later, did it back in 2020. I did three years in Genesis, the second time I went through. But the first, first year, uh, it was on Sunday night. I, I just walked through Genesis, basically. And then in January, or in, in 2005, he, he gave me Sunday mornings because he was getting ready to retire. He knew he was leaving. And so he was preparing the church and everything for his departure. And so he moved into an administrative position and um, he would still look over my sermons. We would talk about them. He, you know, he would sometimes give me advice, not a lot of theological device, advice. More, It was more like advice on clarity and use of grammar. He was a teacher by trade. So he, he was, um, but he wasn't a theologian. In fact, we had a few theological differences, but what was interesting is he never really seemed to be to 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 take too much of an issue with it. Again, because I don't think that he really had a strong theological focus. I think he had a focus on other things, and so when I would differ with him on on things like original sin or something like that, he would disagree and just say it's okay, whatever. You know, I mean, it wasn't it's amazing how it all worked out um, because really on that it would seem like those would be parts where we really should have had more longer conversations but he it just again he was he was he had been instructed in the disciples of Christ he had come from the he had i think gone to Johnson Bible College is a um is a restoration movement college if i remember correctly uh it's he went to Johnson Bible College and Johnson Bible College, you know, again, he had he had been reared in the doctrines that are taught through the Restoration Movement. He'd been reared in things like uh, baptismal remission. I know he believed that, um, but he, you know, he had a again his theology was sort of all over the map. Um, but in January of two thousand six, I took over the preaching at the church, and or I'm sorry, I took over as senior pastor of the church, and he retired, moved to Texas. Um, so now it's me, it's the other elders who are currently serving in the church, and it was the church was still Forest Christian Church. We just dropped Disciples of Christ because up until ninety nine, we were Forest Christian Church Disciples of Christ, but after ninety nine, we just dropped the DOC and became Forest Christian Church. And so in 
in 2006, I'm coming in. I am at that point basically understanding the doctrines of grace, but I'm not calling myself a Calvinist. I, I'm, I'm more so concerned about being an expositor. I was preaching verse by verse. I was not going to my favorite Calvinistic text or anything like that. I wasn't running to teach the doctrines of grace. I wasn't doing any of that. I was just preaching verse by verse through the Bible. The first series I did was through the Gospel of Luke on Sunday morning. But I, I was doing Sunday morning, Sunday school, Wednesday night. Uh, at that point, we didn't have a Sunday night service. And the reason why was because I stopped the Sunday night service because I was working on my doctorate. So I, I needed the extra time for studying for doctoral work. So the church allowed for me to take Sunday nights and, and stop them. And, and looking back, I kind of wish we would have kept Sunday night service. We, we Now we have the Academy on Sunday night, but Sunday nights are nice. Uh, it's a nice time for a, a little a little shorter but still meaningful time to gather together. So be that as it may, maybe a future podcast to talk about the, you know, where have the Sunday nights gone? But anyhow, uh, in, the, in, in the regard of what's happening, I'm preaching verse by verse for the Gospel of Luke on Sunday morning. I'm preaching verse by verse in Sunday school through the book of Romans, and I am teaching on Wednesday night, and I don't remember what I was doing in, in, in 06, but, but I, it, Wednesday nights have always been more of an opportunity for me to teach more topically, so I may have been doing something something in a systematic or something, but I wasn't, I, I, can't, I can't recall exactly what I was doing then. But the important part of this is in Sunday school, there was a man who was listening to what I was teaching, and he was hearing me teach through Romans, and he was hearing me teach the, 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 what, what I believe the book of Romans teaches. He was hearing me teach things like the doctrine of the total depravity of man. He was hearing me teach uh, about original sin and the effect of sin and the, the, the uh how it makes man unwilling to come to God unless God comes to him first. And uh, he was hearing me say that, uh, you know, conditions of, or rather that election is unconditional. And, and, but he's hearing this in the context of the book. I'm, I'm not just preaching the five points of Calvinism. These are the things that are coming out in the lessons. And he's becoming more and more unhappy with my, my teaching. And, I was not hiding anything. I wasn't intentionally not, you know, I'm, oh, you know, hiding my Calvinism. It just wasn't, it was, it, it, I wasn't saying, I wasn't using the word Calvin, even though I would, I would mention Calvin or Zwingli or uh, uh, Luther in my preaching if I had a quote from them, but I wasn't, I wasn't overtly using the word Calvinism, not because I was trying to hide, but again, I, this was all new to me too. This was all me, the, 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 the way that God used in my life to bring me to understand the doctrines of grace. This was all part of it. But after a couple of years, uh, and I had always been told, this is interesting, I'd always been told, hey, you know, you have your honeymoon phase, and then you have your, your first big battle, and where, what, what happens in your first big battle is going to really define your ministry at any church. Well, that kind of was true. Because uh, we, I had my honeymoon phase, which was about the first year and a half. Everything I did was perfect, and everybody loved it, and you know, everybody you know was always encouraging. And then around 2008, a couple of things converged to bring an issue. One of the things that happened was I began to post videos on YouTube. This was very early in the life of YouTube. I've been doing YouTube for a long time. In fact. If you, I don't even know if you can find it anymore, but I have a, I have an old Keith Foskey page that was just me doing um, videos, and I, I did one on, I did one on Benny Hinn, and it went, it, it went, what, what some might say viral, 250,000 views on that one video, uh, it, and this was back in 08, so you're talking a long time ago, uh, when, when YouTube was still in its infancy. And so the... One of the videos I put out was a video on uh, objections, answering objections to predestination. And it was 10 objections to predestination, and I gave the answers. Well, a few people in town found that video 
and began to come to our church as a result. Uh, one man in particular, he's still a member of our church today, he's a deacon today. He was the first one to call me and he said, hey, you know, I saw this video on, you know, objections of predestination. I liked what you had to say, uh, thinking about coming to visit your church. So I said, well, come on, you know, come visit. So he visited the church and a couple of other of his pe uh, people that he knew uh, visited because they had been in a church that had closed. And so they were basically looking for a new church. And um, they so so we had an influx of maybe four families, five families uh, came at one time. And for a church of 70, 65 to 70 people, that's a pretty big influx of people. And so because they had come in kind of already, they had sort of understood what was going on, you know, uh, in, in, in the preaching, they kind of had, had heard my videos. And, and again, my videos were out for everybody. So people in the church had heard them too. And these are all things I had said in sermons. If I had talked about predestination in sermons, they'd all heard these things. Nothing was hidden in the sense that I wasn't, I didn't have a secret account or anything. It was all out. And, and just like now, I've never been afraid in the sense of, of, using language or, or identifying myself as who I am. So this happened, and um, some of the people in the church, one that one man in particular who I told you about in my Sunday school class, was very unhappy about the, the doctrine of predestination. And I went to him, and, and, and I was I trying to be very clear with him. I said, I said, you don't have to agree with me on this. This is not something that, you know, has to divide us. We can disagree on this and still be brothers in the Lord. Again, at that point, I wasn't really using the word Calvinist, uh, it was just, you know, but that term was being used of me. In fact, one of the things I found, and this is interesting because I, I had known this had happened for years, but I, 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 I didn't have a specific date to go with it. But the other day when I was going through some old files, I found um, a journal that I had kept during this event. And the journal has some specific dates um, and so, for instance, March the 5th, 2009, uh, as I was at the back door, I always stand at the back door, I always give hugs as people leave. It's just been my habit for, for my whole time of being the preaching pastor. I go to the back, I give, I give hugs and, uh, shake hands and stuff. Well, at the back, um, person came up to me and who, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he said, good message. You preached what I believe. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, at the end, you said believers will be saved. That's preaching what I believe. And I said, I've taught that all along. What do you mean? Um, that I just I typed that into my journal because I remembered it. It was as if I hadn't taught that. It was as if I hadn't taught that believers will be saved. And so I, I began to realize there was this sort of thing going on. And then I went to I went to have lunch at my favorite Mexican restaurant. It's a half mile from the church, Casa Maria restaurant. Go go there if you're ever in Jacksonville. March fifth, two thousand nine, same day as this situation had happened, same day uh, that that guy said that at the church. I go to there, and there's a minister from a another Baptist church. And when I walk in, he said to the person sitting next to him, "That man's a Calvinist," and I like stopped and looked at him because he said it loud enough to where I could hear him. And even though he was across the room, I could still hear him. And then he like turned his head and kind of, you know, started talking to the guy like, like, like he didn't want to have a conversation with me. He just wanted to identify I was a Calvinist. In fact, I've said over the years, that's the reason why I'm your Calvinist because of that interaction. I've, after that, I said, you know what, if that's what the local, the, 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 and when I say the pastor of the largest Baptist church on the North side of Jacksonville, it, it most certainly is, and still is to this day. He is a megachurch leader, and um, if I mentioned his name, some of you would know who he is, but I couldn't do that. But anyhow, long and the short of it is that that moment sort of changed a few things because that was like, okay, I'm being called a Calvinist. I know what I teach and what I preach is, you know, I know I believe the five points of Calvinism, but I don't usually use that term. Um, but... I, I began to realize there was something, there was sort of an undercurrent in the church that was unhappy with what I was saying, what I was believing, what I was teaching. And so I said, um, I, I need to go talk to Jack Bunning because Jack Bunning was an elder. Jack Bunning was a charter member of the church. Jack, if there was anything going on in the church that anybody, that, that, that people that would know what was going on, it would be Jack Bunning. So I called Jack. I said, hey, Jack, is there, I said, can you meet with me? 
like on a Wednesday. We met on a Wednesday. Uh, sometime after this happened, so I guess it was uh, probably later in March. Um, and uh, that, like I said, it was all, all about that same time. So I went to meet with Jack Bunning. And when I... When I sat with Jack, I, I asked him this question. I said, is there something going on? Because I feel like there's an undercurrent. Is there something going on? He said, yes. I said, well, can you tell me what it is? He said, sure. He said, I need to know, are you a John Calvin believer? And I'll always remember that way of saying it. Cause that's exactly what he said. Are you a John Calvin believer? And I said, um, what does that mean? And he said, I don't know, but that's what people are saying. <laughs> And so I was. I appreciated his honesty. I appreciated the, the 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 fact that he had just heard this thing and he wanted to know what it meant. So he and I talked for more than two hours about the scriptures and about what I believed, and uh, about what I had been teaching for the last now two and a half years. I mean, this is March of two thousand nine. So you figure I started in two thousand six. So all of two thousand six, all of two thousand seven, really all of two thousand eight. So this is three years into ministry. And um, it's only now an issue. And it's an issue because one man took issue with it and was trying to stir up the, the congregation. Because what, what I found out was that one man that I mentioned had been having private meetings in his home, had been trying to encourage people to see me removed or, or challenge me or, or whatever. I, you know, he did not like what I was preaching, did not like what I was teaching, and he wanted it to stop uh, by whatever means was, was most efficient. So when I, when I finished my meeting with Jack Bunning that day, I felt like, okay, this must be my time to leave. Been here for three years. Uh, this is about what I expected. You know, the first big battle, you're going to decide whether you're going to go or whether you're going to stay or you're going to stay and fight or you're going to leave. And to be quite honest with you, I thought maybe it was my time to leave. That really was my, was my thinking. Maybe this is just it for me. So I went and wrote my resignation. But I did have the, the wisdom, a little bit of wisdom, to seek out the wisdom of someone who'd been doing ministry a lot longer than me. And I had met Tom Askell. Tom Askell was the head, still is the head of Founders Ministries. Back then it was called the Southern Baptist Founders, uh, I think, and uh, eventually became known as Founders Ministries. And Tom and I talked on the phone. I was so grateful that he took my call because he didn't really know me. I'd only met him once at a, at a conference. And he told me something that I didn't really want to hear, but I needed to hear. Because I said, Tom, I think I, I think I need to resign. I, I don't want to split this church. I don't want to cause a problem. I'd rather just leave. And I'd rather just move on and find a church that will receive me and, and, and hear what I have to preach. And he said, don't resign. He said, stand, take a stand for the truth. He says, if you stand for the truth and they fire you, then at least you stood for the truth. He said, he said, but if you walk away, then you're, you're not, you're not, you're not taking a stand. You're not doing what you should do. He said, don't, don't walk away. Make them make you leave. And I was very intimidated. I'm not going to lie. I, I mean, he basically said, you know, stand up for yourself. And I, I've i kind of throughout my life, you know, had to battle somewhat with, with fear of standing up for myself. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for the times I have stood up for myself, but uh, normally I had to really dig deep to, to get those feelings. And so I was thankful that he encouraged me to do that, but I'm not going to lie, I was very scared. So all of this story leads up to what I'm going to do now. I'm going to read to you what I wrote because I did end up changing it some. And that Sunday morning, my associate pastor at the time was preaching for me because I told Jack after our meeting Wednesday night, Wednesday night was Wednesday night was tough. I said, I'm going to go home and, and pray with my family. I'm going to go home and be with them. And I'm just going to take Sunday off because I need to decide what I'm going to do. Talk to Tom Askell, I think, on Thursday or Friday. So Saturday I'm praying. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Sunday morning, some things happened at the church. The man who had been 
causing the different issues, left the church angry after Sunday school, made sort of a scene. So I get a call saying, hey, this guy left. He made a scene. So I was like, well, I'm going to come in. And I brought my letter with me. And this letter is going to take a minute to read through because it's a couple of pages. But I want you to hear what I wrote and then tell you what happened after. Because what happened, I, walk, I waited for the, 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 for the associate pastor to finish preaching. And then I, once he finished preaching, I walked up to the pulpit and I said, listen, I know you just heard a whole sermon and I, I know you don't want to sit for another hour. I said, but I need just a few minutes of your time. I want you to hear what I have to say because this is important. And so this is what I read to the congregation on that Sunday. Uh, I do not have a date on this, but it was obviously after the, it was after the March 5th incident. And this is what I wrote. First Timothy three, 14 and 15. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may, not, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Here we read that the church has a very specific responsibility to uphold and support the truth. What is the truth? We need, to be, we need not be confused. John 17, 17, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So we see that the thing we are to uphold and support is God's word. This is our mandate. This is our command. This is our mission. You know that as your pastor, this has been my pledge from the beginning. As I begin to read my message today, I want to ensure you that this is not a statement of resignation, as it may sound. Rather, this is a statement of declaration of who I am and a refutation of some false things that have been said about me. I'm going to stop reading for a second. Part of what was happening was that not only were I, was I being accused of being a Calvinist, I was being accused of preaching and teaching things that were not true. I was accused of teaching that abortion was okay, which was totally crazy. I was accused of being of teaching that um, babies uh, who babies who die in infancy don't go to heaven. I've never taught that, so I was accused of teaching all kinds of random things that were just just. Absolutely. I was accused of not being evangelistic. I've always been very evangelistic, very much a Ray Comfort fan and love his methods and use as, and have employed them and have had videos of myself doing so for 20 years. So all of the accusations against me that were very untrue were just caricatures of Calvinism or misunderstandings of Calvinism. So that's why I said that part where I said, you know, this is a statement of declaration of who I am and a refutation of some things that have been said about me. All right. So I'm going to continue. It has recently come to my attention that there is a great confusion within the church about what I teach and preach from the Bible. It's been made clear that that some within the church have chosen to subversive, chosen by subversive means to bring greater confusion within the church and, and even accuse me of malicious actions and having impure motives. Such, I can assure you all, is not the case. Statements have been raised recently about the fact that I believe and teach the doctrines of election and predestination. Let me begin by saying that I'm very surprised that this has only recently become a problem, as I have believed and taught these things since well before I was called to preach. My sermon library, which contains now thousands of messages from the past five years, and that's not an exaggeration, I preached a lot, is prepared to, is, is peppered throughout with these teachings. My Sunday school class, as well as my pulpit ministry, has included these teachings. I have not changed. Some say, we've never noticed it, but this is not because I haven't taught it. I have ample evidence that I have taught this all along. But for any of you who have questions about what I believe, here it is in a succinct statement. Number one, I believe God is sovereign over everything in the universe, even the will of people. Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Psalm 135, 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the sea and in all the deep. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans of a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord, it will stand. Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. It turns, he turns it wherever he wishes. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Isaiah 46, 8 through 11, remember, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and the from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel will stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my own counsel from the far country, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. 
So that's number one. I believe in the sovereignty of God over everything in the universe, even the will of people. Number two, I believe that man is a rebellious sinner who refuses to seek God. Romans 3, 10, 11 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. Number three, I believe that man is morally unable to come to God unless uh, because he is bound in sin. John 6, 65 says, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by my Father. Number four, I believe that God grants the ability to come to Jesus, and when he does, the person comes willingly. John 6, 37, all the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Number five, I believe that faith is a gift from God. He opens our heart to believe when we were yet bound in unbelief. Romans 12, 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Philippians 1.29, and to you is given the, on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are you saved through faith. That is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Acts 16.14, one who heard us was a man named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Finally, I believe God has chosen and predestined all who will be saved before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed is the God, or excuse me, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his will, so that according to the counsel of his will, so that we who have, were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And Romans 8, 28 to 30, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he called... And those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. So let me just stop right there before I keep reading. Uh, that was a lot. I, I think I read every single verse of that that morning. Uh, looking back, it's hard to recall. We're talking now 15 years ago. But I, I just wanted to be clear. The, this, these are the things I believe. These are the verses that I believe support what I believe. Um, you know, Call it proof texting if you want, but, it, but at the time, you know, you don't have time to exegete everything. You're just saying, this is what, this is what I believe. This is where I'm getting it. It's not just come. It's not just in, you know, coming out of nowhere. So having said that, I, I followed up with this. Most people, when they hear this, imagine God standing at the door of heaven, holding people back from coming in. It's not that way at all. God sees the entire world in rebellion. No one is coming in. No one is seeking him. So he chooses to open the hearts of some to do and uh, as an act of mercy and grace. Election keeps no one out of heaven who would otherwise have been there, but it keeps a whole multitude of sinners out of hell who would otherwise have been there. Were it not for election, heaven would be an empty place and hell would be bursting at the seams. If someone perishes in hell, it is entirely their fault because they are rebellious sinners. But if a person should make it to heaven, God receives all the credit for that is entirely his work. A great example of this is found in the parable of the great banquet where the king invites all to come, but they refuse. So in order to ensure that his feast is not empty, he compels some to go in. This parable is told by Jesus in Luke 14, 15 to 24. To summarize, I believe that man is bound in sinful rebellion and cannot respond to God without a supernatural enabling of the Holy Spirit where God opens the heart to accept the gospel. God ultimately chooses whose hearts he will open and whose he will not. And then I cited Romans 9, 14 through 16. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. These things I have stated concerning predestination, I believe, and have always taught. Likewise, here are some things I apparently have been accused of, but I do not believe. And this is where I move in the letter to those things that people have accused me of saying. Number one, I do not believe man is a robot. We make choices, we have freedom, but it is not absolute. The only true free being is God. Our freedom is limited. He is not. When our freedom conflicts with his, we lose. Obviously, parroting R.C. Sproul there. Number two, 
I do not believe, as has been alleged, that babies who die in infancy go to hell. This is a canard used by those who disagree to bring an emotional appeal. Belief in predestination does not automatically mean belief in babies going to hell. Uh, for proof, I offer Dr. John MacArthur's book, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. Dr. MacArthur believes in predestination. He also believes that God saves infants and does not send them to hell. I believe the same as he does. <sighs> Number three, I do not believe evangelism or prayer are unnecessary. I believe that both are part of God's plan in bringing about his will. I've taught on both. I believe that through uh, that though God knows whom he will choose, we do not. As Spurgeon said, we do not go around lifting up people's shirt tail to see if there's an E tattooed on their backside, an E standing for elect. Because I do not know who is elect, I can preach to anyone and I can pray for anyone. Number five, I do not believe it is unnecessary to preach the gospel. The challenge was made that I don't preach on how to be saved. Well, here is what I have preached from day one, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, uh, excuse me, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What I have also taught is that if you believe in Jesus, it is not because you're better, smarter, or more spiritually gifted than anyone else. It is because God has, it is because of God's grace alone that you made that decision. He is the one who opened your heart to the truth. Lastly, I do not believe everything that John Calvin taught. Though I would agree with his teachings on predestination, his theology includes other issues such as infant baptism, a particular view of the sacraments, and ecclesiology. The modern Presbyterian church is the closest thing to pure Calvinism as one can get. So my point is this. There are some beliefs that have been ascribed to me that I do not hold to, and if someone says I do, they are speaking in error. So, Here's an important note. Regarding the doctrines of election and predestination, I understand that those who of you who do not automatically accept these things, and I have never attempted to force anyone to. I can simply preach what the Bible says the way I understand it. What brings me comfort is this. Even if, we stand, even if I stand alone on this issue, I'm not truly alone. I stand beside men like Charles Spurgeon, B.B. Warfield, William Carey, George Mueller, John Newton, John Bunyan, Jonathan Edwards, Martin Luther, Augustine, and the Puritans and the Pilgrims. Today, great men still teach these truths like John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, John Piper, Alistair Begg, and James White, just to name a few. Furthermore, the great doctrinal confessions of the past stand with me as well. The Westminster Confession, the 1689 London Baptist Confession, and even the notes in the Geneva Bible support what I teach. And here are some thoughts on the history of force. Again, I wrote a fairly lengthy letter here. The question has been asked, why has this not been taught before? All that I know is that this church has had pastors who did not believe or teach the whole Bible, one in particular that denied the virgin birth. You know that I have taught, if I have taught anything, that I believe every word of the Bible, even the parts that might make us uncomfortable, even the verses that includes the words election and predestination. Amazingly, too, I also know that you have books in your past that have taught similar things. You've used experiencing God and the purpose-driven life. I don't, and let me stop, I don't endorse either of those. I'm just saying they've used those, and those books have those words in them as well. Ultimately, here is where I will end. This congregation called me as pastor by 100% vote. In my three years as pastor, the one consistent thing that I have been commended for is my pulpit ministry. Now my very understanding of God and his word is being challenged. The one thing that has been consistent, my fidelity to the word, has become unacceptable to some. Because of this, I must take this stand. You as a church can decide what you want to do, if anything, regarding my ministry here. You also must decide what you will do with these false accusations. Will you trust that I have been forthright in my teaching, or will you accept the false accusations that have been made, which I have here addressed? Either way, as the shepherd of this church, I here and now must take my stand. Unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, my conscience is captive to the Word of God, I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience would be neither right nor safe. God help me, here I stand, I can do no other. Amen. And yes, I shamelessly quoted Martin Luther's words from the Diet of Worms there at the end. Well, that was it. That was the letter of resignation, not res not letter of resignation, but rather letter of declaration of who I am. And I read it to the congregation that morning. And I did not know what to expect. I did not know if the church was going to immediately get rid of me or if they were going to have to have a meeting. Uh, but I fully expected that this was going to be the end. But it wasn't. Um, my wife calls it my Rocky moment 
because at the end of that letter that I just read to you, the congregation stood, the congregation applauded, and a few people left not happy, but the vast majority of people did not leave. And those who did stay, some of them needed to be uh, had some questions answered about what was going on, and I was willing to do that. And over the next few years, we went through some times of growth, and I would say a genuine time of revival. But it was just amazing to see God work in that because listening to Tom Askell was valuable because if I hadn't listened to him, I probably would have had a much different letter, and it probably would have been a resignation letter. But it wasn't. It was a letter of declaration. This is who I am. This is what I teach. And if you continue to have me as your pastor, this is the direction that um, that I'm going and, and I will lead. And the vast majority of the church wanted that. They wanted to know what the Word of God said. And I'm thankful for that. So to, to kind of round out today, because I've, I've gone a little long here and I didn't expect this to last this long. I, I, I just wanted to say, for those of you who are, uh, you know, maybe have some questions about, well, you know, you, 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 about the methods or anything, understand, I've been in this church since I was seven years old, and I've seen this church believe all kinds of different things and different theologies and different things that have gone down the pike and different pastors who've come and gone. And so it's not as if they had a, a standardized statement of faith that I was going against. Uh, to be quite honest, they never had a written statement of faith that I ever saw before I became the pastor. And it was it was even after this that we finally sat down and wrote our own statement of faith, which we still have in our documents today, even though we've, we've moved now to <coughs> adopting the First London Baptist Confession of Faith, which some people have asked about. A lot of people ask, why did we adopt the First London Confession rather than the Second? And if you're interested in me looking at that part of our history on a future episode, let me know. Maybe I'll do another episode just like this where I'll walk you through the process of why we chose the 1646 Confession uh, rather than the 1689 Confession. would love to do that as a show, but if uh, just want to know that there's interest out there for me doing it. And tell me what you think of today's show. Was this interesting to hear the history of our church? Was it interesting to hear how I almost resigned and God kept me from that? And how now God has taken us to being a, a, a Calvinistic, a particular Baptist church through the process? Because what happened is after that happened, we began to be a little bit more uh, able to talk about these things because people wanted to know more about them. People wanted to ask questions. We had a conference the first year on what is what is Reformed theology, and then the next year we did a whole year on the subject of ecclesiology, and we ended up changing some of our understanding of how the Bible teaches on the role of elders and deacons, and, and because we always had elders and deacons, but they weren't functioning like the Bible teaches they were supposed to function. And then finally, the beautiful thing was in 2011, we ended up changing the name of the church. We became Sovereign Grace Family Church, and that was because the church had become, well, <laughs> we had become Calvinistic, we had become family integrated in our worship. So many things had happened, and God was in it all, and we're still growing. We're, we're still not, we've not arrived. We have a lot of things that we need to be better at. We have a lot of things that we need to try to continue to reform in. But I can look back to that time and I can say, here's a time God worked, and I'm so grateful. And I hope this story is an encouragement to you. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. If it's something that, if you have another subject you'd like me to address and maybe a forum like this rather than an interview, I love doing interviews. I love talking to people who are, are, are godly men and I can bring them on the show uh, and and, and uh, have have conversations with them. But if, if you like this kind of the show as well, let me know in the comments because I was, uh, you know, I, I want to produce material and content that is encouraging, that points you to the truth and that helps you in your daily walk with Christ. So I pray that I'm continuing to do that. If you like the show, hit the thumbs up. If you don't like the show, hit the thumbs down button twice. Thanks again for listening to Your Calvinist Podcast. My name is Keith Foskey, and I've been Your Calvinist. May God bless you.